the graphics community has always been interested in designing systems and algorithms that run efficiently on modern hardware. And many systems have been created to help with this task. Systems like CUDA and OpenGL for the GPU, systems like Halide for image processing, and systems like TensorFlow and PyTorch for machine learning. And these systems have make use of a single machine really well, but there's a new class of applications that demand access to even larger amounts of storage and compute because they require processing a huge amount of video data with expensive algorithms. So this talk is going to be about exploring a new system that allows you to take all of these existing tools and then use them to write video processing applications that scale out to hundreds of machines. And to give you a sense for why this scale is necessary, let, let me give you a few examples. Facebook's Surround360 VR video synthesis pipeline uses 14 cameras to acquire 300 gigabytes of data per minute, and then it has to synthesize an omnidirectional stereo panorama from this video. Synthesizing a single frame requires a complex graph of 44 stages of computation. And this is challenging to parallelize because it requires both synchronizing frames across video streams and also across time. And as a result, their open source implementation requires seven hours of processing per minute of recorded video. And that's just 14 cameras. There's also interest in using larger rigs to capture human performances, such as the Panoptic Studio at CMU, which generates 14,000 frames per second of video to perform markerless motion capture. And combining the 480 video streams in this dome can require over 24 hours of compute per minute of video, even using a high-end Titan X GPU. And as a final example, there's increasing interest in using, in basically analyzing massive video databases. For example, Netflix recently wrote a blog post describing how they use automated video analysis to automatically find interesting action shots, like this one, that they can use as title images for movies. And you can also imagine extending this type of analysis to ask questions like, when do these same two actors appear on screen in a different movie? Using off-the-shelf Python scripts Analyzing a data set like this can take months of compute on a researcher's math MacBook. So these three examples all have a few common properties. They touch extremely large video data sets. They leverage the wealth of existing libraries and systems to build up their algorithms. And they require really large clusters of machines to provide the compute necessary to process this in a timely manner. So in this talk, I'm going to tell you about a system called Scanner. And Scanner seeks to be a platform for making it productive to combine together existing tools and your own code to create applications like these, and then to make it possible to scale out these same applications to use hundreds of GPUs or thousands of CPUs in the cloud, basically about as easily as you currently use your desktop. And if you're wondering what I mean by scale, I mean along two axes. First, in terms of data from a single video to dozens of concurrent video streams, to potentially several hundred feature-length films or even hundreds of thousands of YouTube videos. And they also need to scale in terms of compute, from a researcher's laptop to multiple GPs in a desktop to, like I said, potentially hundreds of machines in the cloud. So to start off, I'm going to describe an overview of Scanner's concepts. So imagine you want to create a video analysis application. You have a bunch of videos in your local file system or some network storage, and you also have a collection of video processing functions that you want to use to create your application. These can be things like optical flow in OpenCV or human oat pose in Cafe. Scanner helps you write your applications in two ways. First, it organizes and stores your videos by representing each video as just a table in a database, where frame IDs map to frames or other metadata about those frames. And then Scanner lets you construct applications as graphs composed out of your library of functions and they read from and write to these tables. So to explain what it actually looks like to construct these graphs in Scanner, I'm going to walk through an example which tracks a player in a soccer game. So this algorithm has two components. It first runs an expensive DNN-based detector on a sparse set of the frames. And then for each new frame, it runs a cheap off-the-shelf tracker to fill in the sparse detections. Now let me tell you what this application looks like as a scanner data flow graph. So first, I select a table from the database, which for this example is a 30 frames per second video, and then I sample the video to 10 frames per second 
resize the frame because, in this case, the DNN runs at a lower resolution, and then I evaluate the DNN-based tracker, detector, sorry. I then take those sparse detections, realign them with the original dense input video, and then use that off-the-shelf tracker to fill in these detections. And just to show you how easy it is to express this in Scanner, here's the entire program in Python code, which is, fits nicely on this slide. So now I'm going to explain Scanner's operators by describing exactly what each of the nodes in this graph are doing. So for the purposes of visualization, I'm going to be drawing out all of the stream elements being processed to make it clear what the dependencies are. So here, I'm showing you 10 frames from the video stream in gray that correspond to selecting from this input table. OK, so the first feature that I'm going to mention is that Scanner lets you map your code that uses CPUs or GPUs onto every element of sequence. So for the player detection pipeline, I map the resize operation that uses, in this case, eight CPUs onto the input table, and that produces a new sequence. And then I also map the DNN-based DNN detector, which uses one GPU. The black squares here indicate an invocation of each of these operators. And remember in this pipeline, the player detector is only run in a small number of the frames, and that's because the DNN is expensive. So I'm going to insert a sampling operation, which extracts every third frame from the video sequence. And you can see now that it is, the detector only runs once for every, of these, every one of these three frames. So everything so far has been data parallel. But remember that appli the application tracks the player over every frame. So then I'm going to take these sparse detections, along with all the original frames, and then hand them off to an object tracker, which is implemented using a stateful scanner operator. And that's because tracking requires keeping state from frame to frame, indicated here by the blue arrows between the invocations of the operator. As you can imagine, these frame-to-frame -frame dependencies make paralyzing video, you know, paralyzing with a single video difficult. So I'll explain how we deal with that later. So I just described mapping operations, sampling operations, and stateful operations. Scanner also provides several other operators, which are pretty important for video processing. For example, some pipelines need the ability to join frames from different video streams, like if you're computing depth from stereo images. And some pipelines need the ability to access sliding windows of frames from the same stream, like if you're performing a temp temporal filter. And the full set of scanner operators can be used to express a wide variety of patterns. And we found these are sufficient to build an interesting set of applications. So this programming model should be fairly familiar to anyone who has used a parallel system. But I want to highlight a couple of things that scanner does for you, which might not be obvious, but we're important to make these things fast. So the first is, Scanner completely handles scheduling your graph of, op of heterogeneous operations. It'll map your graph across CPU and GPU resources, including making use of things like hardware video decoders. And if you have multiple machines, Scanner will parallelize across frames in a video and across multiple videos by distributing work to each of these machines. And of course, you know, Scanner handles all your standard distributed systems issues, overlapping I.O. and compute, interfacing with blob storage services, fault tolerance and elasticity, dynamic load balancing. The idea here is that if your Scanner application works on your desktop, it should basically just work on hundreds of machines in the cloud. So now in order to parallelize across frames like we're doing here, Scanner has to support parallelizing graphs with stateful operations. So remember that if we naively support state, that means every frame depends on the previous one, and we can't parallelize. But what we found in practice is that the internal state of many stateful operations, like an object tracker, actually only influences a limited number of frames in the future. So Scanner allows stateful operators to declare this bound of influence as an integer number of frames, and then this enables Scanner to parallelize stateful operators at the cost of redundantly computing the overlap of these regions of influence. Not providing this region of influence would introduce those continuities in the output. OK, so another key challenge of video processing is dealing with computations that actually don't require all the outputs, all the output frames from a video. So consider a pipeline which has a, has a stencil operation like optical flow, but it only needs a sparse set of outputs, like this example here. 
In this case, we only want to produce four frames of optical flow output, which requires seven frames from upstream stages of the graph. So Scanner performs this analysis and only computes exactly what's necessary to generate this required output. This per element dependency analysis does result in a runtime cost, but we found it's negligible compared to performing extra frame level operations like evaluating an entire DNN. Now, notice in this example that Scanner only needs to read a sparse set of frames from the video table. What I didn't tell you before is that although Scanner presents the logical abstraction that videos are just tables in a database, internally, it stores the video compressed. And this complicates sparse axes because frames in video are compressed relative to special keyframes, which have to be decoded first. So Scanner's data store maintains an index over the location of these keyframes, and it will use this index to minimize the amount of I.O. and decode work that needs to be performed for these sparse requests. In our paper, we show that for certain sparse access patterns, Scanner is able to decode video two to 14 times faster than using off-the-shelf libraries. So these optimizations and services are, are necessary for performance. But the most important part of Scanner is, of course, its ability to express applications. So we evaluated Scanner by looking back at our two goals, making it productive to write big video applications, and then making it possible to scale them. So we went out and we built a handful of video processing applications in Scanner, some of which have appeared at SIGGRAPH and computer vision conferences. And then we took four of these applications and we looked at how they scaled. So the first application we looked at is about analyzing huge data sets of video. We looked at a film data set of 657 films and a data set consisting of 70,000 hours of TV news, which is, totals 12 billion frames. Now, remember that Netflix application I mentioned that finds interesting title shots? This requires evaluating a DNN to find poses like this. So we did that. We ran it on a single video, and it took an hour. <clears throat> but you know, we want to get results back fast. So we scaled this up to 75 GPUs in the cloud, and we're able to finish it in just two minutes. And you, know, you typically don't just want to run this on one video but on your entire data set. So we ran the same DNN, but now using up to 256 GPUs. So the x-axis here is GPUs, the y-axis is throughput relative to using 20 GPUs, and the gray line is what you would expect to get if you scale linearly. So running on the entire 657 movie data set, scanner scales nearly linearly. You know, and then we took the 70,000 videos in, your, in our TV news data set, and we saw basically exactly the same trend. Oh, and by the way, do, uh, running on this data required no changes to the application we wrote to process that single video. So this is cool, because now I can do something a little bit more exciting. I'm going to try and do a live demo. I'm going to use Scanner to analyze the classic Star Wars love triangle between Han, Leia, and Luke. And, and the question that I'm going to ask is, does the movie actually foreshadow the way that this triangle is leaning based on the amount of time that these characters appear on screen together? Does Han appear more with Leia, or does Luke? So I'm going to answer this question using that actor co-occurrence application I talked about, which involves finding all the faces in the original trilogy and then performing face identification to determine exactly who they are. So specifically, I have a 5,000 core CPU cluster running right now. Um, this is using Google Cloud Platform. And I'm going to run a job right now. I'm logged into the cluster. Yeah. I hopefully I'm still logged into the cluster. Yeah, OK. So I'm going to run a, run a job that basically just does exactly what I, what I mentioned. OK, so this is going to take a little bit of time. Um, and while that's running, I'm going to finish the rest of the talk, and we'll see, we'll see if that gets anywhere. Oops. OK. 
So we also took a look at that Panoptic Studio application, which is the one which does markerless motion capture. And here it took a grad student 24 hours to get results back for a minute of video. They had a student hammer away on a multi-GPU implementation, and that got the time down to 10 hours. But using Scanner, we did it in four hours on the exact same machine setup due to better implementation details. And then we scaled it out to 200 GPUs for a total turnaround time of 37 minutes. And finally, there's the Facebook Surround 360 VR video synthesis pipeline. Using the same machine, Scanner runs this pipeline in 2.7 hours instead of seven, largely because of our ability to paralyze stateful operations. And this parallelism then allowed Scanner to run at eight machines, bringing the total time down to just 18 minutes. And because of the success, I'm excited to say that the reconstructions presented by the Surround 360 team at their most recent product reveal during the F8 conference were generated entirely using Scanner. So now you might be asking yourself, you know, could Facebook have used another parallel system? Well, our goal with Scanner was to design a system specifically for productive and efficient big video processing. And we found that many prior systems met some, but not all of the challenges of this domain. So for example, TensorFlow and MXNet do provide graph execution models that run on heterogeneous machines, but they don't provide all the specific operators for video. And they aren't tightly integrated with efficient video data storage. Spark and RapReduce provide distributed scale out, but they aren't designed for heterogeneous clusters. Other systems like Netflix Archer are designed for video analytics, but they're not currently accessible to the public. So to summarize, Scanner is a system for big video analytics. It's productive, and it's based on familiar data flow graph abstractions, you know, with the careful choice of operators needed for video. And it's scalable. Applications written in Scanner scale out to many heterogeneous machines. We frequently use Scanner in our own lab to analyze pretty large video databases using the cloud. And we'd really like to, you to try it out if it sounds useful. So it's open source on GitHub today. You can download it. Uh, there's documentation, example applications. And you know, it, it would be really cool to see what graphics researchers can do using 10,000 cores. And it's our hope that Scanner lets you do that for video processing. And you know, speaking of, uh, I remember I kicked off that job. Let's, let's see where it is. Oh, cool, it's done. So it took two minutes and 38 seconds to analyze the 300,000 frames in the original trilogy. And the result is Lei and Han appear 80 time, 89 times versus 48, 48 times. So basically, Lei and Han appear twice as often as Luke and Leia do. And in fact, um, I have a visualization of all the shots that we extracted, which they're in together. So here on the left is Han and Leia. You can see it's twice as long, which is what we'd expect. And you can see you know, these are just instances where they're standing together. Thanks. So we have time for questions. I have a question. Oh. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I'm wondering if you've uh, considered anything using it uh, for interactive, keeping it live to do things interactively that would be too impractical for someone to actually sit and wait for an update, but being able to process and send something back without it being a, a completely offline kind of operation, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so that's something we've considered. Um, we, we're working a little bit right now. So the the key the key thing that you want the, you want to optimize for is latency obviously the system so far has been optimized primarily for throughput but we're working on some extensions that involve like spreading pipelines across multiple machines where you could imagine that basically allowing you to to do these low latency operations by doing you know processing a single frame across multiple machines in parallel but yeah so that's something that we're looking at but currently the system um, has been optimized for throughput So I have a, a question. In your paper, there was a figure that showed uh, CPU and GPU scaling yeah. on, a, on a single machine. And the CPU scaling, I think, for some applications was pretty low. Mm -hmm. Do you know, is that 
bandwidth? Do you know what the, the reason for that is? So some of the applications on the CPU already paralyzed um, internally. Okay. So in the case there's like a DNN in there. Mm -hmm. um, the reason, yeah, so it looks like it doesn't scale. That's because it already is using a many, many of the cores. So there wasn't a lot more parallelism to extract. If there is more parallelism to extract, we, you, you would have seen that we got a lot closer to 16x. Um, 